And you should be able to share if you have slides. I do. And I think it may be best to start with slides. At some point, I might switch over to showing the spreadsheet that Zara has predominantly been contributing to that's forming the base of our literature review, but for the moment. Um, okay, I think you can see, um, I'm wondering, oh dang. Can I leave it like this for now so I can take notes? Is this big enough for people? Okay, so Tammy nodding yes. So far it's big enough. If the words get smaller, then I may complain. Yeah, I can. Maybe I'll just, well. Okay, I think I'll do it this way. Oh, uh, so I, have purposefully titled this a selective review of representations of well being in home based field studies. Um, I've never seen the word selective review used, but I think it should start being used in the future. We've had systematic reviews for a long time in scholarly practice. And I think because systematic reviews have become crushing weight. Uh, we've seen the emergence of things like mapping reviews and scoping reviews, which I think were being done under non, like non-classified ways in the past, but now I think it's fairly common to see guidance for what a scoping review is, what a mapping review is, what a systematic review is. And I think over the last several years in multiple of my projects, I am grappling with what kind of review is it when you're not trying to be fully comprehensive, but you are being really intentional about what literature you look at. So the word I came up with is selective for right now. And I sort of want to put it in the title of this paper and define what it means and make it a thing because I think it need I think we need something broadly in science that's different from systematic scoping and mapping reviews. That's what I think we're doing here. So that's why I'm using that word. Um, I don't think, I'm, I'm not married to it though. So we could change that later if it doesn't make sense. The context for this conversation is people in their homes and um, because the reason I say that is that this is not a conversation about modeling type work right now. And what's motivating this review from for me has not been, um, has not gone beyond studies where I am picturing some researchers gathering data, primary data in and about homes and the people that live in them. I'm trying to paint that picture for you because it, I think it's bounding what I'm considering important for this conversation. And I don't know that I'm representing it in words very well, but that's why if you can picture a researcher like themselves or their team member being in someone's home, talking with people, and gathering information about their home. That's the context that I'm thinking about. If we need to expand that, I think that's part of the reason to bring up or make this presentation is to have some discussion about whether that's too tight of a scope, but that's what I'm picturing. And then these researchers uh, of which I, I guess sometimes I feel like I am one, may think of the home as an important place where lives can be improved or made worse. 
And these researchers um, hold the belief that they can measure things in people's homes and about the people living in those homes that will reveal opportunities to amplify benefits and dampen detrimental effects. So what do we, or I'll say like maybe me, what do I think is the problem or challenge is that if researchers like the ones I've described want to measure physical parameters of the home and its quality, there's guidance that they can turn to for making decisions about measuring these parameters. So Dr. So-and-so decides they want to measure indoor air quality, but they've never measured it before. There's a fairly clear logical thought process that um, they could find online or by talking with researchers that study indoor air quality that would lead them to decisions about what to measure. And this has happened to me before. People have had, you know, said, I want to include indoor air quality in my study. I've never measured indoor air quality before. What should I measure? And the conversation we have is fairly formulaic. Like, what, what is driving your interest in that? Are there health outcomes that drive that interest? Are there uh, physical irritation problems that drive that interest? And from there, we can get to what to measure specifically um, and how to measure it. So an example here would be, I'm really interested in you know, how to measure whether people are um, getting exposed to COVID. That's you know, a conversation that came up uh, plenty of times over the last couple of years. Um, and so they, there may be a rationale for why they would measure indoor carbon dioxide. I don't need to go into the specifics right now, but I, what I'm trying to illustrate is that if you wanted to understand indoor air quality, you didn't know very much about it. There's a fairly well-worn path of decisions to make that will bolster your rationale for what you choose to measure. And then once you choose what to measure, um, how to measure it, specificity, sensitivity, the types of devices that are acceptable in the research grade um, environment and the protocols that would be followed to ensure the quality of that measurement, those are pretty standardized. Or if they're not the exact same, they're um, standardized enough that you can report on them. Others reading your work know what you're talking about and um, can compare their measurements to you. So this is where I'm coming from um, in, in that the same types of researchers now have become maybe more interested than they were in the past or more of them are expressing that interest in um, measuring well-being in the same types of settings. They're going into people's homes. They're trying to measure things about the home. Um, but I would say that unlike indoor air quality or, or other um, more maybe physically based observations of the home and the people living in them. There's uh, less structure for making decisions about what to measure with respect to well-being and how to measure it. Um, so before I go forward, I, I think there are varying levels of um, like or there's people in this group intersect in this space differently. And I am curious maybe specifically about those that have on the home research side of things, does this seem fair? Or is it like before I advance, like does this seem like a fair characterization of the problem or a problem? What's maybe missing? Um, like it won't matter much what we talk about after this if we don't agree that, if this is a problem or if you're like, I don't understand why this is a problem. So I wanted to start here. Um, maybe pause. I can't tell if people are raising their hands or not. Um, I only really see Tammy. I don't see any hands raised, but I encourage people to just jump in. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to raise my hand, but I'm just going to jump in. Sorry. Yeah, please. Um, this really resonates with me. I mean, I think we, we dealt with this, you know, even a little bit on the survey we designed last summer, right? Um, the question of what to measure and for what reason and uh, what's the purpose? And there's always, always this question of this question of well, let's say we find that um, you know I don't know um, stress measured by this scale doesn't increase, but this other thing that sounds really similar to stress actually does change based upon some independent variable. I mean, 
there's really difficult questions about what exactly you should measure and how um, is, it, I think, an even more difficult question oftentimes and the chance for omitting an important part of the story because you chose to one indicator of well-being or one construct over another. Um, and it's, uh, I, I have no no great answers. Um, I think sometimes what happens is we say, well, no one's done this yet, so we're just going to plug in this construct. Um, and um, I guess that's one way to do it, <laughs> but it's not the most informed um, thing necessarily. I think, uh, can I? Yeah, go for it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I don't know, actually. I don't know. I mean, from what I am aware of, people are interested in well-being, but they're not even close to being interested in measuring well-being. They're just interested in trying to characterize some indicators of it, and you know, some of them are not even interested in field work. They're just running models and coming up with indicators. <laughs> Others who are doing Asian-based models, they are doing field work. And there I see what most common practice I see is that they come with some theories that they know about, like theory of plant behavior, something like that. And then they come uh, with some ideas for what they want to measure, but then they seem to just pick whatever they think they can measure and use that as come up with very weak proxies sometimes really poor proxies that's not there doesn't seem to be a genuine effort to really get at what they want to measure so you know um but i don't know if the people out there who are social scientists you know card carrying social scientists who are doing field work who are interested in well-being but are you know i don't have enough experience to really ask the right kinds of questions that i don't know but certainly i know that people more in quantitative modeling work who are realizing that they're trying that they that they need to better understand human aspects of decisions are starting to think about broadening their scope of variables they're interested in, but they don't even get close to field work <laughs> for the most part. And I I want to follow up a little bit on the agent-based modeling reference you made. So I, I actually appreciate the perspective more broadly that you presented, but something I find interesting is that if you reference agent-based modelers that are doing some field work, I would say that's the kind of thing I was hoping to learn about. That's completely off my radar. Like I don't interact with agent-based modeling researchers or if they are, they don't speak of themselves that way. My exposure to agent-based modeling has been through this project and primarily through Radial's interest in it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm only mentioning this based on the papers I'm reading. <laughs> so I see yeah. that papers are developing models and they're using some field work, but it could be that they're not doing it themselves, that somehow they have access to some surveys that somebody did, you know? So I, I myself, am, I'm a step, you know, definitely a step removed from ABMs myself. So Raidul probably is the closest to those if he wants to say something about this. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for coming. I think you have mostly covered all of the assumptions related to the ABM. So there are always two ways to do that. So first mm -hmm. of the, we do a survey and we collect those survey. And based on that, we integrate those survey data into the ABM to characterize human decision-making process. Uh, but in heat pump literature, the most common practice is to use the already established different uh, decision-making process like the theory of planned behavior you mentioned and cherry pick those variables uh, and then implement it for better uh, representation. So, so oh, go ahead, who is going to speak? Well, I have a question about how all this fits together in your vision of this selective review. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think what Narsimha and Raidul are referring to is a little bit different from the from the papers that you're referencing that you would like to review. So mm -hmm. in my understanding, and, and you're gonna to get to this probably, I might be ahead of the curve a little bit, but in my understanding, you're hoping to review people who have actually tried to measure things or papers that where people have tried to measure things. And I think what in part, Rachel and Narsima are referring to is, um, 
people who aren't trying to measure things, but are trying to draw inferences either from, from other people who have measured things or people who, or, or just their own assumptions about what well-being contains. Um, maybe you're going to get to this, but it might be worth addressing where you're going to draw the line. Like those people who have just kind of made up a theory like, oh, well-being equals thermal comfort. So we'll just go with a set point. Um, mm -hmm. are, are you going to be addressing that or are you going to stick to the, to the measured data and then just clearly say, this is what people have been able to measure. Other people might be drawing inferences from this, but I'm not going to talk about that. Is that question yeah. clear? Was it too rambling? <laughs> no, I think, um, so I think you are getting it. What I uh, wanted to say after Rachel had finished, which is that, and I, I don't know the words yet for it, but there, I partially don't know the words because I recognize that surveys are indeed a form of measurement. And in fact, there may be studies that I include in the selective review that involved uh, only survey-based measurement, but I am differentiating my head between people that go out and make decisions about what they are going to measure versus people that use what other people have measured, like you were saying, and draw and use it for their own purposes. I think those are two separate ways of gathering data for your work. And there's sort of a middle ground, it's like not, it's not just making a decision about a model input and like a, using a theory or an assumption to make a, just set an initial condition or boundary condition, but I want to restrict this review to people that are, um, entrenched in field work where they have to make decisions about data to gather from people in, living in their homes. And I feel like the language is just really tripping me up. I don't, I can't like, I can't seem to say what I want, but um, but I think where this review is meant to be Uh, targeted is like the example I gave. I, I think there was a time when we did not do measurements of indoor air quality, like in the 30s, 20, 1920s, and the 1800s. But we did talk about overcrowding. And we knew that people got sick when there were a lot of people in a room. And so over time, we've done more and more measurements to get to a point where when somebody says they want to understand indoor air quality, like I said, there's a there's a logical set of questions that inform decisions about do this, I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna measure this for this long, but not for this long. I'm gonna measure it with this device and in this manner. And I don't think we can with one paper get to that exactly for well-being in field studies um, in people's homes. But I am thinking of that type of research where somebody's maybe operating at relatively small scales of field work, like N of 10 homes to a hundred or maybe a thousand, but not much beyond that. Um, I feel like I'm belaboring this point because I've been stuck on it a lot myself, but um, maybe I'm gonna go forward for now. I think something that was helpful though from both Narsim and Radul um, and Tammy, your question is that right now I'm considering what you have shared about agent-based model field work as being potentially outside the scope of this selective review because uh, of two reasons. One, the way in which the data are gathered potentially excludes it. And the other is that it seems like those, um, if there is a field component, it is, it is uh, considering the person without considering their home. Like the person in their home are not a, not together. It's just the person and things that are asked of them about their well-being. But I could be wrong because I don't know as much about that literature. So um, I think it's something that I would suggest if we think that should be included, maybe we revisit at the end of this discussion, but I'll move forward just to share a bit more about what we're doing. Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. And I, 
I, I see you, you said that you're struggling to find the words. Um, and, and yet I've seen you struggle over the last weeks. And I feel like the, what you bring forward with your words is becoming sharper or more consistent. And so I just encourage you to continue using this group or part of the group as a, as a canvas to mess around on, because I think the more you have to explain it, the better it gets. Okay. Well, I'm grateful for that perspective. I, I feel so stuck. But, um, okay. Thanks, Tammy. Um, so what we uh, are, the selective literature view is expected to yield two key findings. These have been sort of the anchors for me in terms of uh, what I've shared uh, maybe before with the whole group, but particularly with Tammy and Zara. Um, I would like to compile how rep how well-being is represented when it's measured in field-based studies that are situated in a home environment. And out of that review process, I would like to uh, be able to write about the extent to which um, these measures over or under represent certain aspects of well being. Um, so, the idea here would be we would have a set of papers 20, 50, 70, I'm not, we don't know yet, where researchers have intended to measure well being and they have made explicit how they were intending to do that. And we would take what they said they measured and map it onto a uh, into a taxonomy of well-being measures. We've talked about needs, satisfiers, indicators as being three different um, uh, ways in which well-being could be measured, or aspects of well-being, and then further there's a taxonomy like the image I we've referred to multiple times um, from the scoping review paper where there are different domains of well-being like physical health, mental health, eudaimonic well-being, hedonic well-being. That's a that's a um, a more specific taxonomy that we could map what people have measured into that taxonomy. Those the, that mapping would be our work but the taxonomy would not be new. We would draw from existing literature to decide what those bins are and what those domains are. And then we would say, these, this is what people are measuring. And these are the, this is where they land in the taxonomy of well-being measures. And from that, I think we would be able to say things about you know, this domain is represented in 90% of the studies that we reviewed. This domain was never represented. Things like that, I think, would be useful outcomes of this review. So that's what objective two would be. So with that in mind, we defined a search that um, Zara and I have conducted over the last couple of weeks um, that is using the following search terms and possibly variants on this. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, we haven't reconvened to, to tabulate like what additional search terms we've used, but these are examples of the kinds of search terms that we're using um, when we're looking for literature. So home and residential environment are key. Household energy systems we have included, but I'll, you'll see I'll bring up later why I'd like to discuss with the group whether this is benefiting us or not. Um, well-being being stated explicitly or representations of well-being, measures of well-being, um, and emphasis on empirical and field-based studies. Not just an emphasis, it, like at the exclusion of, if a study is not field-based or does not involve empirical co collection of empirical evidence, it's not eligible. But we are in early phases of a literature review process. And so, what I wanted to share next was uh, there are many images like this that you can find looking for guidance on conducting a review. I thought this one uh, mapped pretty well onto what we're actually doing. 
So there are three um, major phases. One is planning, one is conducting the review, and then reporting from the review. And you can see that planning for the review is two steps here, formulating a problem, I've talked a bit about that, and then developing and validating a review protocol. Um, it, that's been an iterative process. I would say right now we're in the midst of step three and four. So we, in conducting the review, we're searching the literature, screening for inclusion. Um, much of what I'm gonna, or what I'm going to present next is really the grappling with inclusion versus exclusion. But ultimately this um, review process would move past title and abstract, um, like quick read to reviewing abstracts in detail and then ultimately developing a set of papers that would be candidate or the evidence base for the review. Um, and we would review them in full text and from that extract the information that's relevant to what we're trying to analyze and synthesize from the literature. Um, I think the reason I selected this image is that it does have this blue arrow that goes from conducting review back to planning the review. So where I'm at right now, December 15th, is um, Zara and I have searched the literature. Um, Zara's, uh, I, in the spreadsheet, I have seen up to 70 papers. Not all of them are field-based. Um, some probably wouldn't meet that criterion, but we're looking at um, nearly 100 studies already between what Zara's found and what I've found. And that is a bit overwhelming to me because you know systematic reviews that are really comprehensive and that fit the definition of a systematic review are typically conducted now by large teams of, you know, I don't know. I've, I've um, talked with um, colleagues that have done this with teams of like five to 10 people. Um, and I don't think we have that person power, but I also, more importantly, I don't really think that's what we're trying or what I'm trying to do. So I'm not, I think, resorting to a selective review because we lack the resources, but I think that the review needs to be more narrowly scoped to provide value in the literature right now or provide a value that I see missing. And if somebody else were, wanted to pursue a systematic review of, of that's related to this, I think that could be warranted, but that's not what we're trying to do. Um, so nearing a hundred studies, I think um, puts us at this blue arrow stage where I'm here talking with you. Um, we could consider this going back to step one that we discuss reformulating the problem um, probably more where I'm at is in, I feel a lot more um, uh, confident that I could defend the problem if people want to talk about it. But I, I think that the problem definition is becoming more clear to me. But what is less clear is how to scope the review so that it's we can achieve our goals or scale our goals to what we can achieve. So here are a few questions that have been on my mind. Uh, and I know Tammy and Zara have heard me talk about this. Um, study setting seems to be you know, consequential to me in terms of the number of papers and studies we take on, but also in terms of the value of the information from the study. So there's been a fair bit of work on that I think could fall under the, that could meet our in inclusion criteria if we don't restrict ge geography that comes from Northern Europe, other parts of Europe, some parts of Asia. But I'm not convinced we need those studies. So I am sitting more on the side of wanting a smaller number of studies and also seeing less value from studies outside of the US and feeling like a, a a valuable criterion would be to say that we would restrict our selective review to studies in the US. But I think that's something I wanted to bring forward because I think there are pros and cons. Um, another question in my mind has been home environment versus home energy system. 
there's overlap. Home energy systems are clearly rooted in the house, but how well-being and home energy systems get treated in the literature when you add in well-being opens up a huge body of literature that I'm not sure we have capacity to review and I'm not convinced must be a part of this review. So there's something, there's some things I think we'll miss out on, but that might that trade-off might be okay. So the, for questions one and two, I'm leaning towards restricting to the US and dropping energy or energy transition from our search. But I wanted to, I don't know, I'm not committed to that decision. I'm just telling you I'm biased. Um, another question that uh, has come up, especially with Zara's input, I really appreciated um, the literature that she's found that relates to indoor environmental quality, well being from an architectural standpoint. And really, uh, maybe a way to be simplistic in thinking about this, there's a lot of people who have studied well-being in light, well-being in noise. Um, yeah, those two alone is like a large body of literature itself. And they don't tend to intersect actually that much on building science, indoor air quality work and well-being. They, they, they can a little, but... Um, it's a large body of literature, and I, I feel like there needs to be some explicit criteria to help decide how things get included or not. Um, and then the other thing that has been coming up is, um, should we consider a more limited set of well-being measures? I've been very broad in thinking that anything that measures well-being in any way should be included so we understand how people are measuring this when they work in homes with people living in those homes. Um, but there are an abundance of studies that measure, you know, the titles that show up with like quality of life and well-being in the home, life satisfaction and well-being in the home. And I am not, um, it feels like that's more an issue of scale. Like it just opens up a larger number of studies than I think we might have capacity to review. And based on our most recent conversation, like one thought was, well, what if we were to be more restrictive about the well-being measures to a, a, a domain like thermal comfort? Um, and that's a critical, that's a, like that really changes, to me that really changes what we are able to offer the literature, but it makes it seem like we might be, like if we believe thermal comfort's an important thing to know about, then knowing about it well and focusing on it might have value. So let me see if that's, that might be it. Yeah, I guess it went, it jumped back. So that I, that's actually all I have. Uh, I don't know what time it is. Um, yeah, we've got um, 10 minutes left. Hopefully you want to end it. Okay. Uh, Nursema's hand is up, and then Brian had a question in the chat. Okay. Do you want to go ahead, Nursema? Yeah, thanks. Um, I can't remember your keywords. Maybe can you go back to mm -hmm. keywords? I'm just wondering if... Uh, so when you say that you don't want to explicitly include home energy, would you then take that household energy systems out from your keywords here? Um. Yeah, that, that is that's the question. Probably the that idea. That, that, that's the question yeah. I'm raising. So if you take that away, I'm just wondering, like, for example, imagine someone who wants to look at the effect of social media on mental health, you know, psychological mm -hmm. well-being, and they're researching certain aspects of home conditions, you know, where kids spending their time alone, whatever, and, uh, and that, I'm wondering if you would pick up something like that in your keywords if you didn't have energy in it. Mm -hmm. And then is that really something you want to include in your review? Because related to mental health, there's so many other aspects that relate to sense of well-being in the home, mm -hmm. both as outcomes as well as drivers. So I'm just wondering, I'm just using that as an example to test out what your scope of your you know, review is in terms of what you're measuring as well-being. I, I like the idea of a domain because it does bound the... There's different elements of well-being, right? Um, and to to link it to this project, if that's if that's the way to do it, thermal comfort is the way or not. But I'm just thinking if you 
If you don't have that, then will you pick up something that's a little bit out of the blue, right? out of left field? I, I think the simple answer is yes. I think that if the, well, to actually, when I think about the home household energy systems, it there's actually a, a trade off. I think if we remove that search term, we um, lose studies because there are studies that show up as person, household energy system that they interface with and measures of well being. And we would lose that. Um, so we'd lose some studies that I'd actually want to keep, like that one that I just gave. But there are a lot of hmm, studies. Well, I guess that's sort of the geographical setting. There are a lot of studies of energy transitions from solid. No, I shouldn't say a lot. There are studies of uh, for solid fuel to cleaner fuel transitions that have tried to consider well-being that would be left out then. Um, and I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm just drowning. But if you focus uh, on the US, then you would a lot of those would drop out anyway. Yes, exactly. Which is what you want, right? You don't want to look at that. In this I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's not to say there's nothing to be learned there, but I think the amount of things to be learned from from adjacent literature domains is large, but at a really low efficiency for, from a, yeah. <laughs> a reading standpoint. Yeah, Jamie's laughing. Like I, hey. and that's maybe to your um, your other point. I. Uh, uh, I'm feeling more like we need to restrict to a domain of well-being measures because there's there's more there's more sloppiness I and mean, it's not sloppy but there's um it's not sloppy I don't think anybody's trying to be sloppy but there are a lot of things that people call well-being measures that's unclear like sort of what you were saying earlier, like they want to measure well-being and they maybe lay out some rationale for like how there's a plausible link between the things that they're interested in, but then they go and measure something that's just like convenient. It's just what they can measure. and has almost nothing to do with what they said they were interested in. And yeah. I don't really want to wade through the thousand studies that have done that. So I have wanted to restrict the review to... Um, a domain and thermal comfort came up because we've talked about that multiple times. Um, so I would we... just say, sorry. go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I, I just think maybe a thermal comfort as a term is jargon and that mm -hmm. maybe you drop the thermal and just do comfort. Maybe you will pick up more than what you want, but at least there may be people thinking about that, but not calling it thermal comfort if they're not, I don't know. There may be other ways to think about thermal comfort. Uh, that's any specific point, but in general, I, I I agree with you. I think it makes sense to look at a domain. I do, I do think it may be useful to look outside the U.S. as well because this is a universal thing a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. if you're able to restrict in other ways, then it may be. I think you may find a lot of field work in the in the Europe that may be useful. Mm -hmm. And cultural, and I guess, the question is: Are you interested in cultural influences on? people's sense of comfort in the home, which you will pick up if you look internationally. Mm -hmm. Like adaptive adaptive comfort, for example, like Singapore, you know what people do differently than people in the US. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do think that variability is interesting. I, and I do think there's a major, there there is a deficit that comes from restricting to the to US studies because I think there's work that's been done outside of the US that's actually really informative. Um, I think where I've struggled is that all of the if if it's US or all of the rest of the world, um, that there's potentially quite a lot of studies um, that we would still have to filter through and decide how to screen in or out. Um, and I can I saw your chat, but I want to not lose track of Ryan's comment. 
if I can go back to that, your question about what is field based. <laughs> I have I have struggled with this, Brian. I'm open to someone's arg I would like someone to convince me that I there's a um can a feasible way to include studies that involve secondary data, but I'm inclined to say no because it makes the, the work a little bit more clarified to me to say it must be primary data collection, but it maybe limits the value of the work that we would do. So to maybe the whole group who didn't read the check, his question was about field-based, is that a primary versus secondary data question or does it mean people going to homes, would online panels count? Um, You think online panels is secondary? They're primary if it's something like, so if like right. you use Mechanical Turk or something like that, it's primary. Just uh, different than like if the Census Bureau did an online panel, which I don't know if they do. Right, that's where I've struggled, Ryan, is that I do see it as primary data collection. It it does not involve a researcher going to someone's or a researcher team member going to a home. So then we have to assess like all the survey questions and how they reflect on well-being. So I don't know if I'm gonna be distracting on this question. I don't want to, I want it to get answered, but I did I wanna, <clears throat> so I was gonna say something to, similar to what Narasimha put in the chat. I, I'm hearing you say, Allison, look, there's hundreds of papers that do stuff crappily. And I don't really want to spend the time to do a comprehensive review on those or a selective, I don't want to select those papers and do a, a full review, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then my fear is though that that your your sense of rejection of those methods will not come through in the paper that you bring forward. And I do think that that's a valuable thing to say. And so mm -hmm. this, I, I'm saying this now because it might relate to the secondary data as, as well. Um, like, do you actually need to review all hundred shitty papers? You know, if they're all, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't really know where to draw the line there, but if somebody's done something badly, is there a way to not have to give as much time to those papers, like put them in a class of these people have done this thing where where you're not, they don't have to be in a table. Like, is there another piece to the funnel where mm -hmm. we count the numbers of papers that did this? There were this many, like a hundred. We did not review them in detail, but we did, we, we are representing them in this review as papers that do this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I think there is a way to represent that. And it to me, it does come like, like you were saying, like in the types of flow diagrams where it's like we had, we, we went from a thousand papers to a hundred, but then 20 of them were papers that we didn't review the full text of. We just reviewed the abstract and based on, um, one or two criteria we you know won't review them in in full mm -hmm. but it's it seems like you're you have a critique um of some of the papers and i there there must be a formal way of saying not just well, maybe it's this assess quality thing, right? Maybe it we need a better description of what our assessment of quality is, right? Did you even explain why you were using this as a measure of well-being? I don't know if that's it, but if you never explained it, I I, I don't know. I I'm happy to talk about this more. I recognize that we're getting near time, and I don't want to take all the time, but it's maybe. Um, refining your exclusion path. Yeah, and that's actually the, the what you just said is the criteria I've had in my head. It's like, if the researcher does not explain why they 
included the measure that they did, then we wouldn't do take it to full review. Like it might meet our criterion to be reported as a study that was included overall, but it didn't go, we didn't use data from it because the decision-making process wasn't included. Um, which is the case for some of the studies that um, Zara and I have found. Um, I think that's a really important criteria because I think, it, I don't know, to me that makes a ton of sense and it should make your job a lot easier. Like you have to have text dedicated to describing your measure. Like, mm -hmm. I really like that. Yeah, and then it's something I think we can apply um, consistently too. That is less tied to like an opinion, so. Um, So I'll just get maybe close. Um, you know where? Where is it? Narasimha, you asked for like examples of of papers. These aren't like seminal papers, or but and and Zara um, has tabulated, found these and tabulated them. But this to me is like a good example of the kind of paper that I am asked to review and see. Not, not at super high frequency, but impact of poor environmental quality to inhabitants, health, well-being, and satisfaction. That's increasing in frequency, but the the thought that goes into why they're measuring what they're measuring for well-being and satisfaction is just super heterogeneous in the literature like they they find a framework and a measure that's attainable in a survey and they put it in and then and then they title their paper this but do you know they have done a survey a primary survey in this paper? um this one particular um I'm not sure. Um, so how did you come up with this number 100? You're coming up on 100, you said, based on which search uh, selection criteria are you approaching already 100? Yeah, so Zara, this is Zara's table that's at 70, and I have a separate, um, I have one spreadsheet that's just on thermal comfort and some of these criteria, and it's 26 papers, and another um, that's on... Um, the more the more broad search and it's around 30 that's i'm not there's some overlap between zara and my searching but we haven't collated that entirely um and there are quite a lot of papers that have housing and mental health because mental health used to be what people would I think this is what people did in the 2000s and 2010s. And then as well-being has become a more, um, like, I don't know, uh, a more well-liked term, I see mental health has dropped out, but the measures might have even stayed the same. That's, to me, that's a separate paper, or not even paper, but that's a separate idea is that what people have measured is maybe stayed the same, but what they're calling it has changed. Um, and that happens lots of times in science, but. It's 11.55. I'm sorry, I didn't, I feel like I didn't really present findings. Um, What's well, helpful to talk a bit about inclusion and exclusion criteria. I guess it's still a work in progress. So um, maybe I can set a time, Tammy, to... Um, yeah, well... And I have a goal of being like through a first screening phase by mid-January, where I think we'll have screened out some of the papers that are not really not um, germane and it'll be a bit more like concrete specific examples that would help people provide input. I'm sorry. 
I, I don't think you should be sorry, Allison. I think what you, you've taken on something hard. And I think um, one thing I value about everybody here is the way that people are committed to rigor in different ways. And I think everyone shares this. You look at something and you're like, oh my God, that's a that's garbage, right? <laughs> how, how would anyone do that? Or why, why should we... Uh, and then there's, the, as you say, in the very beginning, Allison, there's no guidance for what is garbage, right? Like mm -hmm. if, if, if somebody did this with indoor air quality, where it was like, well, just go see if there's any odors, you know, <laughs> then, yeah, we would laugh them out of the room, but there is no grounding for that. Yeah. And so it, what you've, what you're taking on is something difficult, but you're trying to find a path toward guiding people to what's rigorous and shareable. Um, and that's not easy. It's not going to happen the first time through. And I, yeah, I encourage you not to drop your reactions of like, oh, that's just a giant swamp there. I don't want to go there. Um, yeah. it's a natural reaction, but what is it about it that makes it look like a swamp? Right. That's that's your your instinct there is really valuable. And that's what needs to be brought to the field, not your, you know, your your grueling review of like 150 papers, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can I make I'm a not, comment? Not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alison, I just had an idea. So so I, I think you're really this is a really important topic. And I can think of an analogous topic in okay. this field of climate uh, justice. Okay. There's been a long-standing problem that these integrated assessment models have tried to do equity analyses. You're like, okay, what's fair burden sharing across countries? Mm -hmm. And there are all these modelers that have produced all these papers. They take these equity principles and they just developed a life of their own, these equity principles. They come from some paper that was poorly founded to start with. And then everybody started to use these principles that actually had no base. Some of them didn't have any ethical basis whatsoever. And there were paper after paper coming out on this. And it was so frustrating for people who actually have thought about this deeply. And someone wrote a really nice critique. Uh -huh. Totally analogous to what you're trying to say. Where if you replace the word well-being with equity and it's you know modeling studies as they're they're just running all these studies without trying to think about the principles they're modeling of equity. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't make reference to the decades of climate philosophy literature on those principles. So I would forward that paper to you because I thought it was a really nice analysis from that exact lens, which is what are all these modeling studies that are using these principles, but they're not going back to or at least engaging with the normative ideas behind those principles. Mm -hmm. It seems very really analogous to your topic, right? All these studies are trying to simulate building comfort, well-being, blah, 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 and they use these words without really reflecting on them. So maybe yeah. that's useful. I'll send you that. Yeah, that would be... Thanks, Adam. Yes, I saw your comment, uh, so it won't get lost about the evaluating change in the home, but I, I would appreciate the the paper or critique that you're referencing, Narasimha. I, I think... also think, you know, these thousands of papers, you may find some common themes. Like one I wanted to mention to you when I was doing my review, there's a bunch of these technical engineering slash architecture studies that are trying to test out whether when you actually look at real buildings, they perform like the ideal simulations that they are trying to simulate. They have some ideal view. I think there's a ton of these engineering architectural studies that use comfort yeah. and well-being. Yes. But, but they kind of, it's literally just set points or something like that, you know? Yeah, and, right. And, I, so, and you'll find a lot of studies, but there's maybe, for example, if you look for the word set point, mm -hmm. or, 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 you know, like uh, that will give you a bunch of the studies that you're looking for. That's the garbage you're looking for. Rather than looking for well-being, you look for a set point and that'll help you, you know, maybe group the garbage into, you know, what can be recycled. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like the, yeah. the analogy. Um. Nice. Okay. We're totally over even the hour now. So sorry for keeping everyone over and thank you for, thank you all for engaging.
yeah um, thank you for tough process this is but i but i really appreciate people trying um so have a really good holiday break or whatever it is you are doing at least if you don't like these holidays people leave you alone so that's a good thing um yeah and we'll see you next year yep that's right bye everyone bye everyone, bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.